Movies can have a lasting impression on you and bring back great memories. Certain images you will always remember. Things that have been with me all my life and keep getting added to with every movie I see. I will turn this place into the fucking wild bunch if I think you are fucking with me. This is the end of your rotten life, you motherfucking dope pusher! You gotta be fucking kidding. Hello everyone and welcome to My Sailor Heart Podcast Season 4, Episode 167. On this podcast, normally we take two movies that live in our head and heart and put them together over two episodes by one topic or theme. However, today I will be replaying an episode from August of 2019. There will be spoilers. I'm your host, Philip Duke. So if you're not used to being here, if you're new here, um, this is a special show. It's called uh, this episode, special episode. It's called The Quentin Tarantino Effect. It's about the references and influences of Tarantino and what he makes and what I then went and uh, found from all these. So it's really good. I put a lot of work into this back in the day. It still holds up. It's just great. So uh, I hope you all enjoy it. Um, In case you were here last week, um, my dog was sick. He's better now. He had zero platelets. Now he has 769,000 platelets. So that's way more than he should have. But they said that there's no problem with it. So all is good. And uh, Chip isn't here again this week because he's still working on getting his house and doing all that, getting that situated. I mean, he's got his house. They're painting the house. And so we will be setting up next show, which uh, our next show... Uh, Well, I'll tell you now, we're starting with this Quentin Tarantino thing, and then for the rest of the year, it's going to be Quentin Tarantino movies that we have not done on the show. So next week, it's going to be Reservoir Dogs, and then Pulp Fiction, and then Jackie Brown, et cetera, et cetera, and we're going to go up to Django Unchained, because we've done The Hateful Eight and uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So there's that. Um... So I don't know, guys. I'm I'm in a good mood. Um, there's some surprises coming next show. We got a special special announcement to make for our next show. Um, it's very cool. I'm very excited. Chip's very excited, and um, it's just things are good. So I hope things are good with everybody. Um, I was gonna add some more stuff to this, but uh, I think it's good the way it is. And I'm gonna drop right in here into the show, and. Uh, I got some uh, got some good stuff for you coming up, so I uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, on with the show. I explained to my cousin what this episode was going to be about. I asked him if it made any sense, and he wrote me this, which explains a lot. He knows me so well. He wrote, this is his text, he said, Though Spielberg is your favorite, Tarantino had a more visible effect on how you approach films and script writing. You absorbed his views, his influences enticed you to seek them out. Tarantino and Rodriguez changed everything. So I was like, oh my God, that said it perfectly, what I was trying to convey in my notes. And sometimes I was just like, I don't know if anybody cares what I learned from Tarantino. Kind of that's what this is. Like things that you pick up in his movies. And then me, I went out and hunted those movies down to look at them, to watch them. And uh, one of the movie reviewers that Quentin Tarantino really, you know, admires and, uh, you know, looked at all of her old stuff was a woman named Pauline Kael. And in 1969, this is uh, what Pauline Kael said, and it's really good. I really like it. A good movie can take you out of your dull funk and the hopelessness that so often goes with slipping into a theater. A good movie can make you feel alive again. In contact, not just lost in another city. Good movies make you care, make you believe in possibilities again. If somewhere in the Hollywood entertainment world, someone has managed to break through with something that speaks to you, then it isn't all corruption. The movie doesn't have to be great. It can be stupid and empty, and you can still have the joy of a good performance or the joy in just a good line. An actor's scowl, a small subversive gesture, 
a dirty remark that someone tosses off with a mock innocent face, and the world makes a little bit of sense. Sitting there alone or painfully alone because those with you do not react as you do, you know there must be others perhaps in this very theater or in this city, surely in other theaters, in other cities, now, in the past or future, who react as you do. And because movies are the most total and encompassing art form we have, these reactions can seem the most personal and maybe the most important imaginable. The romance of movies is not just in those stories and those people on the screen, but in the adolescent dream of meeting others who feel as you do about what you've seen. You do meet them, of course, and you know each other at once because you talk less about good movies than about what you love in bad movies. So that was, I was just like, oh my God. So I want to start with a quote about movies from Pauline Kael, which I did. And uh, that pretty much sums up like everything, like what we love in films. Like you may not love uh, pink flamingos, but you can get a kick out of people making their sphincters, you know, pucker. It's just, uh, it's, that's an odd thing. But anyway, there's a whole bunch. Um, and what I've done here is I've written out a script so I stay on point and um, all this stuff. So it should be good. So anyway, let's get started. And then later, I'm going to do like a Quentin Tarantino thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the movies in the middle of it. Boom. You're going to get what I've watched in, at home or in the theaters. So first came Reservoir Dogs. But what I saw first was Pulp Fiction. My cousin Chip saw Reservoir Dogs and freaked out and remembers telling me to watch it. I don't think I listened to him, but later on when I was going crazy for Pulp Fiction coming out, I mentioned Reservoir Dogs and he got mad because he told me to watch it long before. But Pulp Fiction blew me away. I loved writing scripts at this time and I've always loved movies. This guy's mind was somewhere else. It was digging at all of pop culture and it spoke to me. Holy shit. Mm. God damn, Jimmy. This some serious gourmet shit. Me and Vincent would have been satisfied with some freeze-dried taster's choice, right? <laughs> and he springs this serious gourmet shit on us. What flavor is this? Knock it off, Julie. What? I don't need you to tell me how fucking good my coffee is, okay? I'm the one who buys it. I know how good it is. When Bonnie goes shopping, she buys shit. I buy the gourmet expensive stuff because when I drink it, I want to taste it. But you know what's on my mind right now? It ain't the coffee in my kitchen. It's the dead nigger in my garage. Oh, Jimmy, don't even worry well, no, about no, no, it. Wait a minute, don't think about anything. I want to ask you a question. When you came pulling in here, did you notice a sign on the front of my house that said dead nigger storage? Jimmy, you knew I ain't seen no shit. Did you notice a sign in the front of my house that said dead nigger storage? No, I didn't. You know why you didn't see that sign? <sighs> why? Because it ain't there, because storing dead niggers ain't my fucking business. That's why. Damn, such good dialogue. Oh, I love it. Talk about coffee. And I was like, I drink coffee. I know what he means. I want good coffee. Anyway, <clears throat> me, my cousin Chip, my friend Joe, and our friend Brian went to see Pulp Fiction the first time. Then I took like 10 of my friends to go see it. Then I took my dad and my dad's best friend to go see it. Then when it came out on Japanese Laserdisc, I made several copies and gave to friends. I remember one time in particular sitting in the back of the room at my friend's house, and I had just brought over the bootleg copy. Her and all of her friends watched it, and whenever they had a question, she would say, Ask Philip. So I would spout out the useless knowledge in my head. No, that's not Jerry Seinfeld coming out of the bathroom shooting. No, red apple cigarettes don't exist. No, that cereal doesn't exist. No, there is no Jackrabbit Slims. That's Steve Buscemi from Reservoir Dogs. It was oh so much fun. Shortly after Pulp Fiction came out, I did watch Reservoir Dogs. And there's a fact for now we're going to jump to Reservoir Dogs. We'll jump back to Pulp Fiction. Um, a fact is the title for the film of Reservoir Dogs came from Quentin Tarantino via a patron at the now famous video archives while working there, Tarantino would often recommend little-known titles to customers, and when he suggested Louis Malle's Au Revoir, Les Infants, from 1987, the patron mockingly replied, I don't want to see no Reservoir Dogs, and there was the title. I don't know where the guy got dogs from infants, but anyway. So check that French film out if you're 
curious. I know I've never seen it, so maybe I'll check it out sometime. And I love the way the dialogue was written and delivered. The whole opening scene about Madonna lyrics trying, tying in with The Great Escape and a guy trying to remember someone's name, Toby, in a notebook. Let's not forget the whole great scene in, of telling Mr. Orange that he has to learn his lines and be able to sell that he is a bad guy. Do they have the pink powder soap we used as kids in grade school? I absolutely loved it. That especially, I remember that really hitting me of that pink soap. It was like, oh my, like the granulated pink soap. It was like, yes, I went to school. He knows, you know, just those little touches or something that really matters sometimes in films and stuff like uh, Quentin Tarantino's stuff. The soundtracks of these films was and is incredible. That is where I learned about the music of Al Green, Dick Dale, the Statler Brothers, Urge Overkill, Dusty Springfield, the George Baker Selection, Blue Swede, Harry Nissen, and so much more. Harry Nissen is really good. There's a documentary called Who is Harry Nissen. It's really good. He does the coconut song. Brother about a coconut. Anyways, really good. Plays at the end of the movie. So great. Now let's start with Reservoir Dogs, which... We've already kind of got into, but anyway, I kind of urge overkill was Pulp Fiction. All that soundtrack stuff was kind of spread out. Um, Reservoir Dogs is where I heard about Pam Greer. Now I knew of Pam Greer, but after this film, I looked up Pam Greer movies and watched almost every one of them, especially after Jackie Brown. The film Reservoir Dogs is a loose remake of City on Fire with Chiang and Fat. So I ran out and rented that, which led me to other Ringo Lam directed Chinese movies and other Hong Kong action movies, especially after my cousin and I watched The Killer. I went on this just thing. I don't know how long. It seemed like years that I was just watching every Chinese action movie that was out there. Some were bad, some were good. Like, oh, such good stuff. Um, and I, I saw a drama. It was a pretty good drama out there. I can't think of the name of it right now, but maybe I'll think of it later. Um, <clears throat> also, after I saw Pulp Fiction, I would read interviews where Tarantino would say how he used to dress like Chiang and Fat in A Better Tomorrow 2. I had seen most of John Woo's films, but could not find A Better Tomorrow 2. So I had loved A Better Tomorrow, the first one. I also, with that Chinese thing and with The Killer, I went through... All these, I just found all John Woo films. I started watching them all. I couldn't find Better Tomorrow 2. And this is back when you couldn't just, is this streaming somewhere? Boom, I got it. This was, I had to go to like Tower Records or Zia Record, wherever, and I had to find it and order it or whatever. So I finally ordered it. I found it. I owned it. And boy, was it fun and cool. And there's this whole scene on... Uh, it's a scene of falling down the stairs. I had this idea in my head for a script where a guy would fall on his back and he would be sliding down the stair part of the stairs, not like the banister, like in Hard Boiled, but down the stair stairs backwards while shooting. And that happened in that movie. And I was like, motherfucker. I was like, yes. But I was also like, fuck. Anyway. I even rented Get Christy Love, the movie, because I wanted to see what it was. Uh, let's not forget Band Apart Productions. I remember looking that up and finding out that there is a movie called Band Apart from 1964 by John Luke Goddard. It was pretty cool. This movie and Breathless were two of the films that influenced his taste in cinema. So Tarantino loves Breathless. He talks about Breathless kind of a lot if you listen to some interviews. Um... Of course, the torture scene of Marvin the Cop to Steeler's Wheels Stuck in the Middle with You is a great scene, uncomfortable and a little funny. In an interview with Quentin that I read while I was still writing scripts, and I've told this story before, so forgive me, but for anybody who hasn't heard this, it was in some liner notes. I bought a double disc of, it was Reservoir Dogs Pulp Fiction soundtracks, and it came with the liner notes, came with an interview with Quentin Tarantino. Someone asked him, how did you know that Mr. Blonde was going to pull a straight razor out of his boot? He said, I didn't know he was going to do that until he did it. That was when I was like, what? Then later, I got on a roll with one of my scripts, and it start, started writing itself. Then I understood what he meant. And also, just now, today, I just watched a movie called The Big Combo from 1955. 
because doing my research, I had always wanted to see this movie, but in doing this Quentin Tarantino research, this movie from 1955 has them torturing a cop. And it's a really good, you know, I've talked about film noirs on here, how I love film noirs. That's one of the best. This one is really good. It's up there in my top top five or ten for uh, for those film noirs. God, I love those. And while looking up where all the bad guys' names came from back in the day when I was so into, I was just checking, like, where did he figure this out? Where did, you know, every interview, every whatever. While looking up bad guys' names came from, I found that it was a movie from 1974, and it's now one of my favorites, The Taking of Pelham 123, starring Robert Sharl, Walter Matthau, and Martin Balsam. And it's on Amazon Prime. Everybody check that out right now. Pause this podcast and go see Taking a Pelham 123. The remake was nowhere near as cool as this. I love the gritty 70s like movies, like I said, like The Getaway, like this, Taking a Pelham 123. I just love it. Oh, so that was so good. And that's where he came up with Mr. Brown, Mr. Blue, Mr. Brown, Pink, you know, white, all that stuff. <clears throat> then comes True Romance, written by, but not directed by, Tarantino. Brilliantly directed by Tony Scott, rest in peace. Speaking of, taking a Pelham 123, uh, the remake. And this is where I heard a great opening dialogue about how good-looking Elvis was. Then the name Sonny Chiba is mentioned. So, of course, I have to go and look for the Street Fighter, Return of the Street Fighter, and Sister Street Fighter. They are all great. This also, eh, Sister Street Fighter, I didn't like as much as the others. But that was because it was, I don't know, it was just different. Um, this also led me to buying a Sonny Chiba movie once called The Bodyguard. So I'm working at my video store, and this movie comes, The Bodyguard, and I'm like, hey, you know, it's previously viewed or whatever. So I bought it. And it's a Sonny Chiba movie, so it's not the Kevin Costner movie, called The Bodyguard. And at the beginning of that movie, there's a written text of Ezekiel 2517. So all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, like, yes, that's where that came from, you know. So it was really neat, really cool. Um, and then the cool part, Clarence works in a comic book store, loves to go for coffee and pie after a movie to discuss it. And later he mentions movies, The Deer Hunter, Dr. Zhivago, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Then one of my all-time favorite scenes is the Is It White Boy Day scene. I love how cool he is when he walks in and just glances at the TV. Shortly after, Gary Oldman says, On the TV, there's a woman with her titties out. But you ain't looking at that. You've just been looking at me. Now I know I'm pretty, but not as pretty as a couple of titties. Clarence says, I ain't sitting because I ain't staying. I'm not eating because I'm not hungry. And I'm not watching the movie because I've seen it seven years ago. It's the Mac, Max Julian Richard Pryor. What's in the envelope is a piece of my mind. My mind is worth that much and not one penny more. And that was, I was like, oh my God, that is me. I'll, you know, not that I'm fucking brilliant, not that I'm Quentin Tarantino or whatever, but I love seeing a movie, just a glance of it and figuring it out. Oh, it's, that's blah, blah, blah. So I love this where it was like, oh, it's the Mac. So, of course, I had to go find the Mac and watch that. <clears throat> And that's not as good as other black exploitation movies. It was good, but not as good as like all the Pam Greer stuff, um, Jack Hill stuff, all that. Um, and of course, let's not forget, because you were like, Philip, are you done with True Romance? No. Dennis Hopper explaining to Christopher Walken where Sicilians come from. So good. Fucking that, that scene, like my cousin said on the last show, the Jaws dialogue to him. Quint's speech, the Indianapolis speech, to Chip is as important as and great as Dennis Hopper and Christopher Walken. <clears throat> I would say the Indianapolis speech is the best, which I said last time on the show. I said a bunch, so we won't say that. Dennis Hopper, Christopher Walken is good, and I just watched Heat again the other day, and Al Pacino and Robert De Niro... You know, Chip mentioned that too, and that was really good. So them at the coffee shop is great as well. And when my wife and I had our first date, 
I showed her some comic books and my toys and collectibles. And I was like, why did you even get with me? When the first thing I do is like, look, here, this is called Kick-Ass. This is a comic book. And here's a Batman comic book. And look at this. And then I'm like, and then I'm like, see all, I had this little shelf up above the apartment I was in, had all this stuff and had my GI Joe toys and all this stuff. I was like, look at that. And she was like, "Uh uh-huh. So, (laughs) so, and then we went to eat Mexican food. And when we came back, we watched True Romance, and I explained to her that this is the kind of guy I am. She loved the movie, and it was great to share it with her, and it was a dream come true. I always was like, I wish I could go on a date with somebody and watch, because I'm not a ladies' man. And um, I went on a date with her, and we watched True Romance, and it was so great. And she loved it. I loved it. I always love it. It's just, it speaks to me. Uh, Now let's jump back to Pulp Fiction. This film talked about foot massages, getting your car keyed, jerking off, failed TV pilots, heroin overdose, a gold watch, and an uncomfortable situation at a pawn shop. What I learned from this was the comedy of violence and how well they blend together. Tarantino explains that this comes from the first time that he saw Abbott Costello meet Frankenstein. It was funny but scary at the same time. So he puts those things in his movies. Marcellus don't like to get fucked by anyone except Mrs. Wallace. And I shot Marvin in the face. Even the uncomfortable laugh. Do you see a sign in front of my house that says Dead Nigger Storage? Good stuff and a great movie, which I just played. Such a great, oh, it's such great dialogue. And it just kind of rolls, you know, when we get to From Dust Till Dawn, we'll talk about that as well. But shortly after this movie, Quentin Tarantino would come out with Rolling Thunders Pictures Presents series on video. So at the time, I looked up where this came from and found out that it was a movie called Rolling Thunder from 1977 with Willem Devane and Tommy Lee Jones. I then found that movie and watched it. I love revenge pictures, which is what this is. So, like, uh, slight spoilers. I told you there's going to be spoilers in here. But Willem Devane is a Vietnam vet, and so is Tommy Lee Jones. And he gets some guys break into his house Willem Devane's house and put his hand in the garbage disposal and turn it on and chop his hand off. So then he goes and gets revenge on them. And it is really cool. Um, Also from this line of videos was a movie called curdled with the actress, Angela Jones, who played Esmeralda Villalobos. What does your name mean? I'm American honey, butch. My name don't mean shit. Tarantino saw her in this short and cast her, and then in 96, they made the feature-length curdled movie. It was okay, but I can't remember much about it. But what I have here that I'll share on a video on Instagram and Facebook is a poster when I was working at the video store of Switchblade Sisters, directed by Jack Hill, and it's a Rolling Thunders, you know, presentation thing. So uh, it's really cool. Uh, the movie is eh, okay. It's better than that Curdle movie, but uh, not again, not as great as other Jack Hill movies. Um, and then uh, this is where I just wrote this about. Uh, I just saw a movie recently called Kiss Me Deadly, um, which we'll get to when I get to what I'm watching, what I've been watching. Uh, Kiss Me Deadly from also from 1955 is really good. And I had recently read about a glowing suitcase in this movie like Pulp Fiction. This suitcase, though, has nuclear chemicals in it, like uranium or whatever. And they tell me, don't touch it. And this person touches it and she dies because she tries to double cross the guy. And uh, don't do that. Anyway. And Modesty Blaze is a 1965 spy novel that Vincent is reading through most of the movie. Modesty Blaze is a really cool character. She's like... You know, I mentioned Mac Bolan before. She's like a James Bond. She's female. She's almost like a hit squad. Like, it's just really cool. Um, A girl at work before I saw this movie, eh, maybe after I saw this movie, she was telling me about Modesty Blaze, and and I got a book, and I read it, and it was really good. She lent me one of her books. Um, So Modesty Blaze, it's a series. You should go out and grab it. And uh, Nam's Angels, a.k.a. The Losers, in the 1970s biker movie that is playing when Butch wakes up in the morning. It was fun and a good time. I found it shortly after watching Pulp Fiction. It is about a motorcycle gang hired to save POWs in Vietnam. So 
what I did, I don't remember. I just remember watching Pulp Fiction and I was and I wanted to like I said, this is the point of this podcast. Is so I said, "Oh, I got to I got to find out what movie he put on there cuz he must love that movie because he put on a TV. If I was doing a movie on a TV, I would put somebody watching Raiders of the Lost Ark, The Getaway, you know, whatever." So I said, oh, man, he must like that. So I looked it up. I don't know how I found it, but I found that it was called The Losers. It's on Amazon Prime. You should check it out. It's pretty fun. It's got William Smith in it. Not Will Smith, William Smith. Um, so so that was cool. Um, the whole pawn shop scene is really great. You're on the edge of your seat. The way Ving Rhames delivers his lines in that scene is amazing. What now? You know, what now? Well, I'm going to get a couple of couple of hard pipe hitting niggers and anyway i can't even do it justice but that scene and he goes no i mean what now between you and me oh so good and you're just like holy shit like oh man and with that i didn't put it here but um i had read what they were gonna do for that scene for the uh they did surfing guitar or whatever for the rape scene what they were gonna do is my sharona and they tried it, but it made it too comical. Do 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 do. You know, with the with the motion of whatever, it probably didn't work. So they uh, they said, "Nah, let's go with this other thing." So they did. Then, of course, there's a whole dialogue towards the end of the film where they are talking about Arnold, the pig from Green Acres, and Kane in Kung Fu, and you're just like, again, it's those member berries, it's whatever. It's like, I watch Green Acres, yeah, the pig, yeah, that's funny. And Kane and Kung Fu, oh my God, they mentioned fucking Kane. They mentioned Kung Fu, awesome. And speaking of Kung Fu, that brings me to the MTV Movie Awards in 1995, where Quentin Tarantino gave out a Lifetime Achievement Award to Jackie Chan. Now, I remember seeing this, it was MTV Movie Awards, I'm watching it, and they play, you know, everybody was Kung Fu fighting. And they have this whole montage of all Jackie Chan fights in movies from wherever i don't even know if i ever heard of this guy i i think maybe i had heard of him but i didn't know how great he was so then i learned how cool he was and then i went looking for jack chan movies and couldn't wait for a movie called rumble in the bronx which came out later that year and it did not disappoint such great fights and stunt work i've seen several jackie chan movies since he is so good his he was even in you know I talk about how I love John Woo, the killer. He was in a John Woo movie called I think that one is Young Tigers that he was in, and it's you know he's not Jackie Chan he's just a you know, just a guy, and uh, also him and Sammo Hung were in uh, Enter the Dragon which is cool always cool because they're both friends they both went to the Peking Opera together. Um, and on Criterion Channel, they have a whole, there's a documentary on the police story stuff, like not documentary, a little thing of how they do their fights. And it's him showing how they use old school techniques and it still works and it's really great. And then there is one of my favorites just for a scene, just for a segment. It was Four Rooms a movie of four interconnected stories, and each one is directed by a different director. I like the Robert Rodriguez one, but Quentin Tarantino's is the best. Robert Rodriguez's is, is, is the second best. And my personal favorite, like I said, is Tarantino, The Man from Hollywood. I love this so much for several reasons. I saw this in the theater. I love how it is a bit like Twilight Zone and Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and that it has some great dialogue and acting in it. And I did not want to give, I don't want to give it away if you haven't seen it. So that one I will not spoil because it's just a small little vignette. It's so good. And where Quentin got the idea was from an Alfred Hitchcock Presents in 1960 called Man from the South, a short story by Raoul Dahl, which does great fucking stories, that was adapted. I have seen this episode once and it is great. I need to see it again. So I was hunting for this, and I've been hunting for it lately, and I need to find it because I think I was looking up what they call it in the show, in the movie. Now I sound like an old man. Um, is the man from Rio, but it's the man from the South. So I need to look it up again because 
It's Steve McQueen, Peter Lorre, and they're fucking badass. It's it's as good as that thing that Quentin did. As good as his section in that movie, that's how good that episode is. Fucking great. So, everybody check that out. And Tarantino mentions The Bellboy with Jerry Lewis and how it is completely silent performance. The Bellboy is great. Check it out. I had already seen Jerry Lewis movies. I might have delved into him a little more. Um, but, yeah, it's it's great. Um, rest in peace, Jerry Lewis. Uh, now we get to From Dusk Till Dawn, which was written by Tarantino and directed by Robert Rodriguez. Bank robbers escape to Mexico and end up trapped with vampires. How fucking cool is that? So you go to see this movie, and you're like, you've seen the trailer, but you're like, you're like, eh. And then all of a sudden, you're like, holy shit, wait, they're bank robbers. This is cool. This is like Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction type thing. And then all of a sudden, you're like, wait, now they're in this bar, and everybody's turned into vampires, and they're locked inside. And it was fucking a great premise. So cool. Great dialogue. The opening scene alone is worth buying this movie. That is what I wrote, and that is what I agree. I don't care what you think about cheesy, whatever, all the sequels. I like the third one better than the second one. So I would, if I had to own them, I own the first one, but I would own the third one, not the second one. I've seen the series. It was three seasons. It's pretty good. Um, I don't think they're coming back for a fourth season because it's been a while, but it was pretty cool. Um, but that opening scene alone, so good. I will turn this place into the fucking wild bunch if I think that you are fucking with me. Explains so much. Like right there, like in that dialogue, the wild bunch is bloody. He means he'll turn this place bloody. Holy shit, I get it. And then, thank you, Quentin, for introducing me to Michael Parks. Holy shit, this guy was good. So, Michael Parks, again, I've explained to it before on the show to you guys that my dad is, I'm like, Dad, watch this scene. I want you to see this opening scene. And my dad's like, oh, that's Michael Parks. I know him from Then Came Bronson, a TV show that I used to watch, you know, motorcycle guy. And I'm like, oh, you know Michael Parks? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, I just discovered him. He's like, no, he's been around since, you know, 60s and 70s. I'm like, awesome. So then all of a sudden I started watching everything Michael Parks was in. I loved. He's great in Kill Bill, uh, especially Kill Bill 2. Yeah, playing uh, Bill's father. Oh, so good. Um, And while doing research for this episode, I found out that when Juliette Lewis asked Richie, what's in Mexico? He says, Mexicans. This is an exact quote from The Wild Bunch. I never put that together before. At this point was when I decided to direct the movie that I was writing myself. It was this movie and Broken Arrow, I know, eh, that kind of gave me an idea for my script that would be Thicker Than Blood. Also, I remember finding out that Quentin had named Salma Hayek's character Santanico Pandemonium from an old 1975 Spanish Satanic Panic Plus Nuns movie, which I need to find that movie because it sounds, it sounds awesome. I want to I wanna get that. Um, then there's Jackie Brown. Now, I really like Jackie Brown. And the big thing about this movie is that my cousin Chip and I went on Christmas Day to see this movie, opening day. It was me and him and a man and woman, uh, and the movie started, and it was great, but then it got to where Ordell goes to the bail bondsman, and the power went out. I was like, what the fuck? Chip and I discussed whether we should leave or wait. We decided to wait. So for what seemed like an hour and a half, but probably wasn't, the power came on, and it was worth the wait. You know, I was just like, you know, I remember those people. I was like, I wonder if they're going to leave. And I think maybe if they would have left, we might have left. But I don't know, because I really wanted to see this movie. And this is where I became a huge fan of Robert Forster and Pam Greer, of course, even though, you know, after Reservoir Dogs, you know, I had seen her movies. But then I might have watched more after this. But uh, uh, first of all, Uh, it has a lot of Roy Ayers music from the coffee soundtrack. And if you're a listener of the show, then you have heard Colleen on here. She bought me the coffee soundtrack on CD back in the day. It was so great. So around this time, her and I were talking about how great Pam Greer was. And we sat down and we watched uh, coffee and we watched Foxy Brown. And I think I like coffee better and i think she likes foxy brown better but i'm not sure but 
Anyway, they're so good, so fucking good. So, and that soundtrack is good. I love the black exploitation. I love the, you know, fucking, doom, 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 you know, just the shaft soundtrack, like all stuff like that. The groove, the, oh, awesome. And because of this movie, I ran it across 110th Street. The movie's theme plays over the opening credits of Jackie Brown, and it's a good movie. I liked it. I was like, oh my God, Yafet Kodo? What the fuck? So that was awesome. Uh, Chris Tucker makes an appearance, and then I hear Strawberry Letter 23 by the Brothers Johnson, and I love it so much. Like, I knew that song, but when you see that song played to him driving, like, hey, we're going to go, keep this shotgun, jump out, do this. Okay, I got it. You're just there for scaring. You don't have to kill anybody. You're just, okay, man, I'll do it. Drives him around, drives him through, you know. He's not even going anywhere. He's just driving to the empty field next door and then just fucking shoots and kills him. So great. Um, also, this movie is where I fell in love with the Delphonics. Didn't I blow your mind this time? So sometimes it's just one song in a Quentin Tarantino soundtrack that I really dig. And that was one. This didn't I blow didn't I blow your mind this time? Anyway, I can't do it justice. And Sig Haig appears in this film as a judge. And it is so great because he is in Coffee and Foxy Brown with Pam Greer. And they look like they're having so much fun when they do those movies. Like, and so I'm sure that on set he was like, hey, and they were like reminiscing and it was cool. And anyway, it's just really neat. Those are little things that you want to imagine. And Ordell mentions John Woo's the killer when he explains that people typically want to buy two guns rather than one because they all want to be the killer. Moments like that make you so excited. You're like, yeah, they mentioned my fucking movie that I love, that I watched twice in a row. Um, before this movie came out, I read Rum Punch by Elmore Leonard because I, th- I was like, what's it about? So I read the book because I wanted to see. It was a good book and different than the movie, of course. Same characters are in his 1978 book called The Switch. So that's pretty cool. But also in an interview with Quentin on one of the talk shows uh, when this came out or whatever, Quentin said that he shoplifted this book when he was younger. So that's kind of cool that he shoplifted the Switch that had the same characters in his rum punch that he would grow up to make the movie. It's just really cool. Then we get to the masterpiece that is Kill Bill 1 and 2. Now, with... With these, uh, you know, I'm hoping this all flows right because um, I took some days off before I came back to write these notes. So anyway, let's get into it. I have told the story of the five, six, seven, eights and how Quentin heard it when he walked into a store in Japan. He knew that he wanted it for Kill Bill and asked for the CD. They checked the store and they were out and then asked, he asked to buy the copy they had because he knew that he would forget the name of the band or not follow through on it. So they sold it to him, which is cool. And then he puts a band in the fucking movie. Like, how cool is that? Like, you're a little band. All of a sudden, you're like, wait, who wants us for his movie? Um, I just got done watching, which I explained, the big combo. And there was a part in there where the woman in the hospital is explaining where she saw or heard the name Alicia. She says that she was watching Mr. Brown, the bad guy, as he wrote it on the frosted window And then when he saw her, he wiped it off. Just like in the movie, when she writes Bill on the glass. Also in the big combo, which I wrote, they torture a cop. So you had the big combo, torture the cop, and kill Bill stuff. Like, I think this is just maybe in his head. And then he's like, oh, wait, we can write on the glass. Or he's in that scene going, how is she going to explain it? And then he remembers, oh, yeah, in the big combo, she said this. But that wasn't even showing it. She was just talking about it. So... It's pretty cool. Anyway, I like it. Um, The Blood Spattered Bride was a movie that I rented and found because of this movie. 1974 thriller. It's a good one. Um, The theme for Death Rides a Horse plays during this movie. And it's such a good Marconi, however you want to say it, Ennio Marcone, Ennio Marconi, whatever, song, and a good little movie. And... I found out about the female convict scorpion movies. So there's a series of these female convict scorpion. um, And I found them because of this. They are really cool. The main song is on the soundtrack and it is great. It plays at the end of both Kill Bill films. And of course, everyone knows that Game of Death is where Quentin got the idea for the bride's yellow and black outfit from the first film. 
and the Ironside theme plays every time the bride sees an enemy. I used to watch that show with my grandma. She loved it because it had the same guy that was in Perry Mason, Raymond Burr. So I like that just because it's the music. You're like, cool. But then also you're like, I, I used to watch that with my grandma. So it's pretty cool. Um, again, after this movie, I had to run out and rent Lady Snowblood from 1973. So I heard about this. Now I had to go buy another movie or rent it because I don't have any of these movies anymore. So I don't know what I did with them after I got them, but I should have fucking kept them. Um, it's a good revenge picture, which also includes a song, The Flower of Carnage, which is so great. On that soundtrack, I love it. It's uh, so beautiful and melodic. Um, so I may have heard him mention this before I saw this movie, but I saw They Call Her One-Eye, a Swedish exploitation film from 1974. That is the inspiration for Ellie Driver having the eye patch. And I think what it was was when I was at the video store before Kill Bill and all this came out, that it was a Rolling Thunder stuff. And I was just looking up what movies he liked because he wasn't putting everything out on Rolling Thunders, uh, Rolling Thunder Pictures. And so that's when I found that, and then I went and looked for it again. I don't know where I found it, but I saw it, and it was cool. Now we get to Grindhouse, Death Proof. My friend Joe Weedman and I went and saw this in the theater as a double feature. It is meant to be. That's how you should see it. I'm going to buy the Blu-ray because I like that. So those two movies, in case I uh, haven't said it yet, are Death Proof and Planet Terror. Planet Terror played first and then Death Proof played. And it was and is awesome. Still, Planet Terror is more like a grindhouse movie than Death Proof. It had like, missing scenes and it had scratched up video, uh, um, film and stuff like that. So it was really neat. Uh, the same rubber duck hood ornament is on Stuntman Mike's car as is on the diesel in Sam Peckinpah's Convoy from 1978. So that I just found out. So that was pretty cool. And when you see things like Shanna's Faster Pussycat Kill Kill t-shirt, it makes you smile because you have seen these movies. Everyone check that one out. It is fun. The Death Proof is so cool. Um, so good. I mean, like I said, Planetary is good, but Death Proof's good as a Quentin movie. It's it's just cool. Uh, after this movie, I rewatch Vanishing Point. Great film. Again, they talk about stuff that you talk to your friends about. So, you know, the she's talking about Vanishing Point and how she always wanted to drive on the hood of that car. And she does. Um, now is Inglorious Bastards a masterpiece? People say it is. That's for you to decide. So, um, these... So with all these, now these movies that are a little more older, uh, the, you know, that take place period pieces, World War II, and then, you know, Hateful Eight and Django Unchained and Hateful Eight, those are in the West, so it's kind of hard, but not as many uh, film. Anyway, let's get to it. The Glorious Bastard Masterpiece. So is it? I think it was good. I liked it. Um, I'm still trying to decide out of the whole thing. Kill Bill might be the best. Uh, see, I paused because I, I don't know. Well, Pulp Fiction, of course, is the best for me. Anyway, let's. Uh, I digress. Something I just learned is Hugo Stiglitz was named that as a tribute to a Mexican actor with the same name. So that's pretty cool. Um, of course, I watched the original 1978 version of Inglorious Bastards as soon as I heard about this coming out. And it was so good for an Italian movie. Although it was nothing much in common with this movie. You know, it's just guys on a mission type movie. And now we're on to Django Unchained already. Was where I was excited that Quentin was doing a Western and he did not let me down. So, you know, he loves Sergio Leone. He loves uh, Sergio Corbucci. So it was really cool to see him do a Western. Now, from way before, when I would read or watch interviews, Quentin would talk about these great spaghetti westerns. Like I just said, on there he would talk about Sergio Corbucci, Sergio Leone, and in there he mentioned 1966 Django. So I rented it when I worked at the video store, and it is fun. Opens with Django pulling around a coffin. Gee, what's in the coffin? I won't spoil it, but it is another fun one. Well, I don't have many things that I went out and saw because of this, but I love the soundtrack. 
It's got a great. I love the the thing that I love in this movie, and I'm sorry if all you expected me to talk about the great scenes in each film, but I more wanted to talk about what I learned from Quentin and what I've seen because of him. Is I love that end when Django is in the shootout in the house. The explosions are like cannonballs, you know, because it's uh, it's cap and ball guns. And it's like, oh, my God, like so, you know, so great. Just and, the you know, and then, you know, you got a little James Brown in there and you got some rap, you know, and some R&B. Oh, so good. Just all tied together. And uh, I did find these facts. OK. For Django Unchained. The White Buffalo is a movie western with Charles Bronson from 1977 and his sunglasses were the inspiration for Django's sunglasses. So I was like, oh, that's cool. Also, you may know, but the scene where Leonardo DiCaprio smashes the glass down, I knew this already, but I put it in here just in case nobody heard it. When he smashed the glass on, on the table in the middle of the dinner scene, he really cut his hand, and you see it bleeding, and he carried on his lines, and they left it in the movie, and it's great stuff. It's really cool. So now let's take a pause for a second while I tell you guys what I've seen at home or in the theater because here's what I've heard from people. Like I said last time on the show, I heard from two people. Yeah, we like hearing what, you, what you've seen. I'm so curious. And the other two people go, eh, I don't much, I don't like that. Put it at the end, put it in the middle. I want you to get to the show. Make it shorter, do something. I said, well, I enjoy doing this. I enjoy watching movies and telling people what I've seen. And the other, whatever, uh, 30 people I have not heard from. So I don't know what they think. But anyway, let me know what you guys think. But here is what I've seen at home and in the theaters. I saw The Boys, 2019, Amazon Prime. Really good. I said through it all in one night. Boom. It was awesome. Now, The Mad Bomber from 1973 which I had heard about in there was a there's a podcast, three hour podcast called Pure Cinema. Um, it had Quentin Tarantino on it, and he's going through his calendar for the year of the New Beverly, because he owns a New Beverly. He was going through his calendar, sorry, for the month of June leading up to July, sorry, leading up to once upon a time in the wet in Hollywood. And what was awesome was this movie was in there and it's got um Chuck Connors in it from Rifleman but this is 1973 Rifleman was in the 50s so it's really cool seeing him be like this creepy like bomber guy like he's got these glasses on and it's kind of they on that month they wanted to lead everything for what's playing in the 70s and 69 like what kind of movies were coming out about then and what kind of movies Rick Dalton might have been in then I watched American Grindhouse, a documentary from 2010. I wasn't sure if I'd seen it. Started watching it. I was like, yeah, I did see it. So I kind of played it in the background, but it's good stuff. It makes you go, oh, yeah, I got to write that one down. Then I saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood again. I think I saw it last week. Anyway, I've seen it twice so far from 2019. Really liked it. Um, I'm going to probably go again before it leaves just because I want to. I'm trying to get my feelings of this film. I really like it. I'm trying to. Uh, figure out where I want to rate it. People have said, and even people that work with Quentin said that this is, doesn't feel like a Quentin movie. It's different. And I think it's because he was going for that. Like, that's why everybody's worried that that's his last film. Like he said, either I'll turn 60 or I'll do 10 films. This is his ninth. People are hoping he doesn't stop. But uh, if he does, he left us great stuff, but hopefully he won't. And if he does, he'll still probably write books and things, and that'll be awesome. Um, then I saw The Autop Autopsy of Jane Doe from 2016 because Jason Bromley on his show did uh, spoke to a uh, a coroner, a, uh, an Emmy, and uh, she uh, and they watched that movie, and they talked about it. So I watched a movie, me and the wife, and we were like, eh, it was all right. It was nothing great. Um then I, st I only saw a couple episodes of the third season of Money Heist, which is a Spanish film, a Spanish series on Netflix. It's really good. I really like it. Um, Something Wild from 1961, which I saw on the Criterion Channel, which is really good. It's like a different, you know, it's, it's 
it's more of a drama, but it's this girl gets raped and then she just kind of almost shuts down and, and it alters her in some way. And so then she just moves out of her house, gets a little place in the city in New York and tries to live her life. But people are like making fun of her and then she meets a guy and it's really good. You should uh, check it out. If you have a Criterion channel, check it out. If not, look for it somewhere because it's a, it's a pretty good one. Uh, it's not a boring drama. It's a good drama. And then I, me and the wife went and saw Fast and Furious presents Hobbs and Shaw. And then I was talking about Kiss Me Deadly from 1955. We saw that. I saw that. And that's the one with the glowing suitcase. And that's really good. And, and in that, Ralph Meeker is the actor. And Quentin told Bruce Willis, that's the kind of character that I want you to be. You're this guy. When you're playing the boxer, that's your character. You're this. That's who you are. Then I saw on Criterion Channel, they have Police Story and Police Story 2. Now, these just came out on Criterion Blu-ray. And I was like, man, should I buy those? I really like them. And then all of a sudden they came on the channel and they have all the added stuff to it. And I'm like, oh, awesome. I can just watch them here. So Police Story 1 is from 1985. Police Story 2 is from 1988. They're both great. They both have some great fight scenes. Police Story 1 is the, the main one where he uh, drops down in that, uh, it's like a shopping mall. In uh, He drops down like four stories or three stories down to the bottom. It's really cool. Slides down some lights. Then uh, I watched Stranger Things because I had only seen like three episodes and or four. And so I went ahead and watched the rest of those. Fucking awesome. Um, the Curse of La Llorona, La Llorona, however you want to say it, from 2019. Eh, it was all right. Uh, I didn't care for it. I don't much care for those movies. Sometimes I like them, but that one I didn't much care for. I like the actors in it, uh, but I didn't like that. Um, Batman Hush from 2019. This is one of my top. Like, there's, there's Batman Doom. It's an animated. Batman Doom, that was really good. Uh, the Death of Superman was really good. Batman Hush is really good, so I really liked it. Um, so everybody check it. It's at Redbox. You can rent it. Uh, it's an animated movie, so I don't know if you like it. Then the wife had Dumb and Dumber on the other day from 1994, so we watch that. That's fucking funny. Still funny to this day, like always funny, like just great stuff. Then on Criterion Channel again, I watched Not Wanted. It's a Ida Lupino uh, Presents. She was like producer. And this Not Wanted was about a woman who was pregnant and, like, had to go and try, you know, couldn't get uh, couldn't get rid of the baby because it was too late. And they can't say abortion. They can't say pregnant. None of that. And she goes and stays in this place where nuns are running it. Um, and then she has a baby. And anyway, it's really cool. It's not a film noir. It's just a just a cool little kind of drama it would kind of go with uh but it's not a boring drama again it would kind of go with that uh that other one the uh <clears throat> something wild but um it was really cool um and then heat from 1995 the other day my wife and i were sitting at home and uh going through the uh you know movies anywhere thing and I was like, have you seen Heat? And she's like, what's that about? And I go, you haven't seen it? And she goes, I think I did. I don't know. So I go, it's three hours. She goes, oh, my gosh. But she stayed up for the whole thing, and she really liked it. She said, yeah, I think I've seen, I remembered bits and pieces of it. But, yeah, it's so good. And then Reservoir Dogs from 1992, which is so good. Uh, it had been a little bit since I'd seen that, maybe five years. Um, then we watched Get Hard yesterday, and uh, I forgot how funny that was. I, I thought it was kind of a throwaway thing, you know, but it's it's funny. It's got some good jokes in it and some good stuff, good lines. Um, that's the one with Will Ferrell and uh, um, that guy. Everybody's going, Kevin Hart, you idiot. Yeah, Kevin Hart. Um, then I saw The Big Combo this morning uh, from 1955, and that was the one with Torture the Cop. Write the thing on the glass. It's really cool. Um, it's really good. It's one of my all-time favorite, you know, like I said, up there in the list of five five or ten uh, film noirs. 
and Ringo of Nebraska from 1970, which I watched because it's pretty much what Rick Dalton went out to make in Italy. He made Jim Nebraska, and that's what that was, Ringo of Nebraska. It was not that good. It was Italian. It was funny because it was dubbed, and it was just, eh. Anyway, so now we are on to the Hateful Eight. They had a roadshow presentation. Hang on a minute. I think I skipped. Oh, no, I didn't. I thought I skipped Inglorious Bastards all of a sudden, um, but I didn't. Okay, sorry. Goodness, everybody. Okay, they had a roadshow presentation of this, of the Hateful Eight. And I went with Colleen, and we saw it in 70 millimeter, and they gave a booklet out with it. And it had an intro and an intermission, you know, had like the intro, like with the music, and it had an intermission, and then it had an outro, you know. And Quentin Tarantino catching you up in voiceover after the intermission. So I think that's what's on the Netflix, you know, added 25 minutes uh, version, um, the one that's in four parts. So it was really cool and beautiful. It looked great in 70 millimeter. It was just like awesome. And all that I have for this, of course, is that it was the same feeling of the thing where you are in an isolated place with someone that might be a killer slash alien. Also, same ambiguous ending. So it was so great. My wife hates those endings. My wife was like, well, did they survive? Did they get help? Like, what happened? Like, I don't like that they're just laying there bloody. And I'm like, honey, it's cool. And she's like, no, it's not. And again, a fact that I'm sure you all know, Kurt Russell broke the antique guitar thinking that it was a prop guitar. And so the look on Jennifer Jason Lee's face when he smashes that guitar is real of him like, oh, of her like, oh, shit, he just broke this expensive guitar he thought they had switched it out already so i don't know who had to pay for that but that's interesting and a movie that i haven't seen but i'm definitely going to is called cutthroats nine so again just like the thing he kind of said that he he might have got some inspiration from this cutthroat nine cutthroats nine a spanish film from 1972 where everyone is stuck in one place so that one sounds cool then there's another one I haven't seen, but I heard about, which is Sergio Corbucci's The Great Silence. So it's about a guy who doesn't speak. I think he's a deaf mute, but he's like a gunslinger. Um, but uh, this sounds like it has the same kind of atmosphere as Hateful Eight. And the song that I love is Roy Orbison's There Won't Be Many Coming Home, which is taken from the 1967 musical western The Fastest Guitar Alive. I haven't seen it, but Roy Orbison plays a singing spy who has a guitar that fires bullets. So it sounds fun. I found this on YouTube, so I will be checking this out. I love Roy Orbison. I have this on the on Apple Music. I picked Roy Orbison at Essentials, like, and it's got all of his stuff, and everything is good. It's like all good. So great. Um, now we're all caught up, and we are at Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So here is what I have to say about that. Uh, such a great film. I understand how it doesn't quite feel like a Tarantino movie, but I saw it twice and I like it. It is a love letter to films, Hollywood, and Sharon Tate. I have said before that Moving Target, a.k.a. Death on the Run from 1967, directed by Sergio Corbucci, is pretty much a type of a movie that Rick Dalton would make. They even put it in the movie and show Leonardo DiCaprio in place of Ty Harden. That's the... Uh, Operation Dynamite with him with the little cap on and he's shifting the car and he's jumping the bridge. That's from uh, Death on the Run. I also just watched, which I already said, Ringo in Nebraska from 1970. This movie is basically Nebraska Jim. Dick Dalton goes to, Rick Dalton goes to Italy to make as well, which I said. If anyone hadn't seen the Matt Helm movies, you should check them out because they are fun. I looked them up uh, today on iTunes, and they're twelve ninety nine each. I'm really thinking about getting them because I've always kind of wanted them because I like what they are. So there, there's three of them. There's Murderers Row, The Silencers, and The Wrecking Crew. The Wrecking Crew is the one that Sharon Tate was in, 
in the movie. And what they did was they put Leonardo DiCaprio in some of those movies playing, you know, they would replace an actor, put him in it. But in this, they just left D. Sharon Tate, I'm sure you noticed, in Wrecking Crew. It wasn't it wasn't uh Margot Robbie Robbie. It was actually Sharon Tate. So uh but what I remember about this one of these movies is they're so crazy. They're like trying to be like an American James Bond but a little funny and with some girls. And uh it's uh it's Dean Martin. And there's one where I don't I think it's the first one where he's laying in bed asleep and when his alarm goes off, his bed raises up like a dump truck and dumps him and the blankets and the pillows and everything just right into a pool that's inside his house. And that's how he wakes up every morning. And I was like, well, that's awesome. When I first saw it when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I was like, oh, cool. But then also you're going, well, then you got to pull all the blankets out and the pillows, and then you got to wa- dry everything and wash it because then it smells like chlorine. And blah, blah. Anyway, but it's fun. It's really cool. So speaking of that, I remember watching uh, The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, and he had the alarm set up to like that big speaker system that would play um, Purple Haze when, you know, when he woke up and I was like, yeah, I want something like that. Now they make uh, your phone and you can hook it to some speakers and play it anyway. Really cool. So I picked up a lot of movie titles that I should watch, not just here that I read, but I have a list of movies from listening to a couple Quentin Tarantino um, podcast that he's done recently interviews, um, doing some research, finding some other things. I even made a correction on IMDb today or yesterday, whatever, because somebody had put that what they felt. Now I'm going to talk spoilers right now. Here it goes. Okay. Okay. I'm going to talk spoilers for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. If you haven't seen it, uh, turn off. I don't know how far to jump. Just turn off the podcast. Come back after you've seen it. Is on the IMDb, they said, well, gee, they didn't really change history. I think those people were nobody famous that went in there that Rick and uh, Rick and Cliff beat up. So I think the real Manson, the real family, the main characters would then come back and kill Sharon Tate. So I think they just postponed her life and the people's lives in their Folgers, uh, Jim Sebring. And I was like, no. So I put on there, you know, it's on there where you can, I'm going to go through a whole fucking thing just because everybody writes whatever they want on IMDb. So I click on it and I said, and there's no way to explain why. All you can put is uh, untrue or whatever. Anyway, so my thing is this, and that's why when my wife fell asleep, the second time I went and saw it by myself, first time though she fell asleep, she'd been working and she was tired and that was fine. I was there to watch it, so that was fine. I wish she could have saw it, but I think... She didn't know as much about the Manson family or the killing of Sharon Tate and all the people in the house. So I think she wouldn't have known like Tex. Like Tex is the worst of that fucking bunch. Like fuck Charlie Manson. He's nobody. Tex is a guy who grabs a bunch of fucking mushrooms or whatever it is and just eats the whole thing and trips out. And goes off on this killing spree. And he did the worst things that he could. He's just a fucking psycho. And so Tex is one of the main guys. And Tex is in the house. And fucking Cliff kicks his face in and kills him. And so it's like, no, Tex was the main guy that went in there. And then there was, you know, uh, Squeaky Frome and all those. But. It's like, no, like, this is what it is. Like, their people don't come back. I think they're just like, fuck it, man, whatever. But also things that have come out from this are 1916, after the killing of Sharon Tate and stuff, like, that kind of killed. Somebody wrote a whole article about it uh, back then or or semi-recent about that was when hippie culture, like, died. Like, after they got killed, then everybody's like, fuck that. I don't want to be a hippie. And things changed. So it's kind of interesting. I always thought the innocence of the 50s went away when 
we got when JFK was assassinated. And um, and then it seems like then TV and movies got a little more like real and stuff. But that's neither here nor there. But write me if you want to discuss it or whatever. Um, a couple of things that I have also learned during this research is Quentin says that Dogville from 2003 may be one of the best scripts ever written for film. So check that one out. I know I will. Because that was the one with, uh, I think it's Lars von Trier... And it's got, uh, um, oh, man, I can't think of her name. But anyway, you know who I mean, Tom Cruise's ex-wife. Um, anyway, and uh, so, uh, and then also for anyone out there, including myself, who may never send any movie scripts in or follow your dream of being a filmmaker, know this, Quentin Tarantino dropped out of school in ninth grade. So here's what I think of all things that I talked about. I had it scripted so I could stay on target. So other than that, I think it was a good show. Um, it turned out better than I thought. I could throw my passion in there and not lose my place. I got it blown up to 36, the letters, so I can see them. Um, so I don't have to squint, look, and get my glasses. But uh, so on my favorites, I don't have this written down, but Pulp Fiction... All-time favorite. Um, maybe then Kill Bill. Um, Hateful Eight. Um, uh, Django. Um, the uh, the Inglorious Bastards. Eh, Reservoir Dogs. Uh, maybe fourth in there. And, uh, and then maybe right now, not last, but kind of around that is once upon a time in hollywood not last because i like what he did i understand what he did it's like hollywood is a place of dreams and this is you know that's why i got teary-eyed at the end of once upon a time in the west in the west i keep saying that i don't know how nobody doesn't say that because once upon a time in the west is such a fucking good movie once upon a time in hollywood and i was thinking about this sergio leone did once upon a time in america and that's like a dream type thing. Like there's a part where they try to kill the guy and they shoot in the way of his body. Like it's just weird. Um, and then, you know, like an outline. But Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is like uh, whatever I was getting at, a dream. And it's it's just to, oh yeah, so sorry. Uh, see, this is why I had notes. That. When Sharon Tate gets on the thing and says, hey, are, is everything okay? And Jay Sebring goes, yeah, everything's fine. Um, his name's Jay, by the way, earlier. I think I said James. Um, says, yeah, everything's okay. Then she says, um, he goes, Rick Dalton's here. I'm talking to your neighbor, Rick. And she goes, oh, hey. And she goes, you want to come up for drinks? And he goes, yeah, sure. And she goes, yay or yippee. And that just made me like, she embodied Sharon Tate. Like, that was, you know, like, if you heard the stories of the Manson family, if you haven't, just don't go look at it. Just enjoy the movie for what it is. But it was so horrible that she was pregnant, and she begged for them to not kill her, and they killed her, and the baby died. And, uh, like I said, it was just so brutal. And... So all those people deserve to be in prison. And Tex is still fucking alive. He should be dead. But they got rid of the death penalty right as they were being tried or whatever. So they got life in prison. Anywho, that's my story on that. So I really like it. Uh, I really like all of his stuff. That's what I've learned from this show. Hopefully you've all enjoyed this, what I've learned, what I... You know, I wrote on my scripts. I never sent my scripts in. My buddy said, you should send them in because all that will happen is they'll say no. And I said, no, nah, I don't feel like it's ready yet. And I would try to rewrite it as I write. And that's never good to try to rewrite as you write because then it just you just keep backing up and keep backing up. And But I had some good stuff. And that's when I was like, I'll just do it myself and try to sell it. And then you try to do it with some people and people get busy. And your passion is not quite what their passion is. And so they're helping you out. But they're also like, well, I got kids in football and I got to go see that football game. And 
You're like, okay. And you're like, we'll do it some other time. And then you never do. And then you drop down to a shorter film. Then I said, okay, I'll do the shorter film. So one time this really cool thing happened. I'll tell right now and then I'll end the show. There's a movie called Marnie and and a movie called both Alfred Hitchcock. Marnie and uh um oh, fuck. Damn it. Um anyway, so on Marnie, she's stealing some money and there's a scene where it shows her stealing the money while the maid is walking by not the maid but that the cleaner lady and all of a sudden it's like you don't you know it's like oh is she gonna get caught and then she comes out and she puts the stuff in her purse and you're like oh my god so great and so there was that stuff where i told my buddy i said hey man we should really do like um it's called torn curtain it was right after marnie I told my friend Sergio, I said, we should do, I want to do something like this. And I put on Torn Curtain. I showed him the Marnie stuff. I said, it's really good. I had the book, uh, Truffaut on Hitchcock. Really good book. Um, and then I watched a documentary that came out last year. Um, and so Torn Curtain, I show him this scene. There's a scene in Torn Curtain. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. Because at least for this scene, it's fucking great. Torn Curtain, uh... Paul Newman comes in and he's being chased by this guy and he goes into the safe house because he's kind of a spy tells the lady there hey I need to be in watch by this guy she goes no problem so she tries to like hide him and play like it's all fine that guy comes in they're just sitting down having like tea like it's a place right like like it's like it's a bed and breakfast type thing so this guy comes in they start talking all of a sudden she uh, hits a guy over the head with a shovel and then they try to shove him in the fucking oven and to suffocate him they turn on the gas and they're shoving his head in there and he's fighting and there's this whole real great fight scene of like like Alfred Hitchcock explained like it's hard to kill somebody like I didn't just want to have somebody die like I wanted to show that it's hard to kill somebody if you're trying to strangle them and they're fighting it's very difficult and so it's really cool. So I said, Sergio, look at that. I go, isn't that great? And I go, and then while I'm showing him that, I'm going, I'm trying to figure out what to do for this short film, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm, then I'm writing, then I want to write, and I want us to do. And he goes, well, duh, do something like that. Just write, write this thing. And I was like, holy shit. Oh, my God. So I went home, and I just, I just started writing. And it fucking wrote the whole thing out. It was a bad guy who's coming to kill this guy that stole money. The guy isn't expecting him yet. He's trying to leave. They walk in. It's the main bad guy and his henchmen. They won't let the guy leave the restroom, leave the kitchen. The guy goes to go into the bedroom, says, hang on, I got to change. They stop him. They go, no, you get back here right now. He goes for the gun on the table. They pull him. They go, that was a desperate move of a guilty man. I'm fucking proud of that line. Sorry. I was like, oh, my God, that's so cool. And uh, and then they knock him down. And then he starts fighting. The one guy goes out. He tells him where the money is. The one guy goes outside to get the money. And he starts fighting the main bad guy. And he's grabbing for a toaster. And he's being pulled back from the toaster. And he and because he, he can't he's got nothing else to fight with. So he grabs a toaster, finally gets hold of the toaster, beats the fuck out of the guy and kills him. And then is waiting, and when the he hears a beep, 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 when the guy comes in through the front door, and now he's like, oh, shit. And so then when the bad guy comes there, the henchman, he sees the bad guy laying there. He's dead, but he can't find where the main good guy is. And he walks by this closet that's in the living room, and it's a sliding door closet, and the sliding door slides open, and the guy steps out, the good guy, and he's got a knife in his hand, a butcher knife. And he's right behind the guy. And he's walking up behind the guy like real slow. And the camera's following him from behind, showing the knife. And as that henchman turns the corner to go into the bedroom to check if the guy's in the bedroom, when he walks into the bedroom and the guy behind him is following him, getting ready to strike, right as they enter the bedroom, there's a full-length mirror across the room in the bedroom. And the henchman can see the guy behind him. 
and he twirls the gun around like a uh, outlaw Josie Wales type thing and uh, spins, spins around, hits him in the head, knocks him down. Uh, the guy drops a knife. He grabs him. Uh, the guy passes out. Then it goes to black. Next thing you know, it opens. We're in the desert. The guy like is looking around. He's on his chest. His arms are tied behind his back. And he's looking around. He sees a shadow. And the shadow behind him is the bad guy with a shotgun. And he's going to uh, blow his head off. And as he walks up behind him and he gets ready to cock the gun, then all of a sudden the guy closes his eyes real tight. And then it goes back to the beginning of that day when he's trying to make calls and all that. And showing, and then he starts having all the stuff he's doing, like the toothpaste cap goes, like, rolls around on the sink, and he's like, oh, wait a minute, this just happened, deja vu. Things keep happening, he's like, wait a minute, oh, shit, I need to change. So then he realizes he needs to bring that money right back, like, right away. And he goes to the door, because he's going to take that money back, and when he opens the door, there's a bad guy. They're here to talk to him, just like that happened in his dream. And he can't talk his way out of it. And I was like, oh, fucking great. So anyway, anybody, take that. Make a short film out of it. Have fun. But that was something that came out of a movie that I watched that my friend said, write that. If you like that, write that. So just like how I wrote Thicker Than Blood, it was, oh, let's have two brothers against each other. Kind of like Broken Arrow, but they're brothers. Like, let's do that. But... You know, with cool stuff. Anyway, really cool. So uh, thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Uh, like I said, turned out better than I thought. I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, let me know. And uh, until next time, I'm Philip. And uh, this was our one-year anniversary, by the way. So um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, and then next week is on the 26th of August is my birthday and I'll turn 48 man I'm old and so uh I don't know what I'm going to do for that but I'm going to do something I'll figure out something great and uh and you'll hear it so uh thank you everybody for listening I hope you all enjoy and uh oh and check me out on uh Jason Bromley's podcast Talking Poop where we talk about Red Heat and uh man is that a good movie it's it's a good little action comedy movie. Uh and Arnold doesn't say one liners in it much. Uh hardly at all. So anyway, okay, check it out. Uh thank you and uh have a great day, night, evening, and whatever. You know what one of the greatest fucking scripts ever written in the history of Hollywood is? What? Top Gun. Oh, come on. Top, Top Gun is fucking great. What is Top Gun? You think it's a story about a bunch of fighter pilots? Yeah, it's about a bunch of guys waving their dicks around. It is a story about a man's struggle with his own homosexuality. <laughs> That's serious. That is what Top Gun is about, man. You've got Maverick, all right? He's on the edge, man. He's right on the fucking line, all right? And you've got Iceman and all his crew. Right. They're gay. And they, are, they represent the gay man, right. all right? And they're saying, go. Go the gay way. Go the gay way. He could go both ways. What about Kelly McGillis? Kelly McGillis, she's, she's, she's heterosexuality. She's saying, no, 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 no. Go the normal way. Play by the rules. Go the normal way. And they're saying, no, go the gay way. Be the gay way. Go for the gay way. All right? That is what's going on throughout that whole movie. He goes to her house, right? All right? It looks like they're going to have sex. You know, they're just kind of sitting back. He's taking a shower and everything. They don't have sex. He gets on the motorcycle, drives away. She's like, what the fuck? What the fuck is going on here? Right. Next scene. Next scene you see her, she's in the elevator. She is dressed like a guy. She's got the, the cap on. She's got the uh, aviator glasses. She's wearing the same jacket that the Iceman wears. She is, okay, this is how I gotta get this guy. This guy's going towards the gateway. So I gotta bring him back. I gotta bring him back from the gateway. So I'm gonna do that through subterfuge. I'm gonna dress like a man. <laughs> All right? That is how she, she, she approaches it. Right. Okay. But the real ending of the movie is when they fight the medics at the end. All right, because he has passed over into the gay way. They are this gay fighting fucking force, all right? And they're beating.
beating the Russians. The Kings are beating the Russians, all right? And it's over, and they fucking land, and Iceman has been trying to get Maverick the entire time. Finally, he's got him, all right? And what is the last fucking line that they have together? They're all hugging and kissing and happy with each other. And Ice comes up to Maverick, and he says, Man, you can ride my tail! It's yes. time! And what does Maverick say? Maverick, you can ride my tail!